So in this way, uh, the lectionary passage is a very interesting, uh, to me, set of instructions. I almost entitled this message, Rules for Radicals, but that felt too radical. So uh, I'm just going to title this message, uh, Be a Sheep and Don't Be a Goat. <laughs> and you'll understand that when we read uh, the passage on today. Uh, we're going to go to Matthew chapter number 25. It's a very familiar passage of scripture, I'm sure. Uh, it is uh, the lectionary passage for today, and it gives to us, I think, uh, a wonderful summation of Jesus' uh, kind of admonition to all of us who would claim to be people who want to follow him and follow him well. Uh, I love this passage of scripture. I love Advent. I love this season because it constantly reminds us as followers of Jesus that we are not following uh, some uh, set of teachings that were not embodied. Oh, somebody. That we are following uh, a set of teachings that were literally made flesh through the life, through the work, through the ministry of Jesus. And uh, these words for thousands of years have created quite a conundrum for all of us who follow Jesus because the ideals of Jesus are very much at odds with our own ideals, or at least our own practices. How many have ever had some ideals, some principles that you have tried to live into and then when the rubber meets the road, you'd be like, mm, mm, mm. I, I meant better than what I actually have done. Anybody can be honest about that today, right? I, I, I didn't mean, you know, to, to, to cuss them out, amen, but something just happened to me. I didn't mean to, uh, you know, hold this grudge for so long, but for some reason I can't let it go. I know the scriptures admonish me to treat my neighbor this way and to respond to this crisis this way, but for some reason, my ideals don't always align with my actions. Jesus and the life of Jesus gives us an embodied, meaning a concrete expression of what it means to live in the tension of the good that I know to do and often I don't do and the ways in which the whole of my life is intended to form me well after the ways of Jesus. And so this is Jesus, one of his kind of summation uh, passages. Jesus on his way uh, to the cross, giving his disciples some final instructions. And uh, Advent, as we will discuss, is, is always this uh, liturgical kind of marking in the calendar of the Christian church that Jesus has come. Jesus is coming and Jesus will come again. This idea that Jesus is always showing up in the most unlikeliest places. And my question for some of us is, will we be ready when Jesus shows up? And this is where the passage, I believe, speaks directly to us. Matthew chapter 25, verse number 31. The scripture says like this, when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with them, then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at the left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. 
I was in prison and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you or naked and gave you clothing? Now, this is the righteous asking the Lord this. This ain't. All right, so this, let me see. this the sheep asking the Lord this. This ain't the goats. I want you to think about that for a second. They already have been kind of declared righteous, but they're asking the son of man, the shepherd, when was all this happening? Verse number 39. <clears throat> Authority, and the king will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did it to me. Whew. Then he will say to those at his left hand, you who are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer. Now, again, this is the goats <laughs> asking the same question as the sheep. Isn't it fascinating that neither of them knew <laughs> what Jesus was talking about? And yet, the Lord says, when, or they said, Lord, when was it we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger? or naked, or in prison, and did not take care of you, then he will answer them, truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Whew, heavy passage on a Sunday. In a heavy world. But this is the word of God for the people of God. Let us say thanks be to God. So we're going to talk, as I stated, from the topic, be a sheep and not a goat. Let us pray. God, we want to say thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. We ask you to hide this word in our hearts so we will not sin against you. And as I stand to preach and teach a word, send the anointing that makes preaching and teaching easy. May our hearts be soft to hear, and we will say thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Let the people of God say amen. amen. Come on, look at your neighbor and tell them, be a sheep. Be a sheep. Don't be a goat. Don't be a goat. Now, I know in our modern linguistic lexicon, all of us are trying to be a goat. We want to be a goat in every part of our life, right? Be a goat in your business. Be a goat in your relationship. You trying to be the best, the greatest of all time. Goat for all y'all who don't understand what we're talking about. I was like, what are you talking about? I'm not no goat. It's an acronym that stands for the greatest of all time. And there was a time where there used to only be one goat. And everybody was like, they're the goat. Muhammad Ali is the goat. Michael Jackson is kind of the goat. <laughs> Florence Griffith Joyner, goat status. But now I see everybody's the goat. 
I'll be on social media and people proclaim themselves the GOAT. Be like, I don't think the GOAT status, with all due respect, was created for you. Because to be the greatest of all time has to be judged by someone other than you. Mm -hmm. So obviously, you can't be that GOAT. But there is another kind of GOAT that too often many of us are easily seduced into. And I want to challenge us today in the world, the context, the culture, the society in which we live, to not aspire to be a GOAT or be caught up in what I will call for today's message, goatish behavior. Now, conversely, there is in our lexicon a whole lot of narrative and conversation about sheep. Oh, don't be no sheep. If someone called you a sheep, it would not be just as FYI a compliment in today's lexicon. It would kind of suggest that you don't think for yourself, that you are caught in somebody else's you know, worldview, your third eye ain't open, you have not tapped into the Illuminati's world order secret information. I often tell my brothers who love to always tell me about Illuminati revelation that if it was such a secret, why do you know about it? If there's one thing we ought to know is if there was some secret knowledge, you would not be the one to stumble upon it. Mm -hmm. Not trying to hate, but I am trying to say that it is fascinating that we live in a world that would literally cause us, as I've even entitled this message, to kind of in our mind, get a little like, hmm, I don't know, Pastor, you ain't gonna say it out loud because you're a little probably too polite. You kind of want to offend me. I ain't, I ain't gonna be a sheep when I leave church today. I just want you to know, Pastor, I'm not no sheep. <laughs> get in your car, be like, can you believe the pastor told me to be a sheep? <laughs> I want you to just open your heart to a uh, definition, a set of definitions about what a sheep and a goat means in the context of the preaching today. I certainly don't want you to be someone who is easily manipulated by simple-mindedness and get caught up in somebody else's project or program in a way that causes you harm, although I will say many of us are more under the trance of someone else's project or program than we care to admit. And I certainly don't want you to not aspire to be great in whatever God places in your hand. But I do want us to think a little bit today about what is God asking of us as we prepare ourselves for another season of Advent. As followers of Jesus, we are in a season where we are preparing ourselves for the coming of the Lord. And this is, for the follower of Jesus, an important season of waiting and preparation. Because we want, as followers of Jesus, to never have the coming of the Lord so lost upon us that we are not able to discern when the Lord shows up. And I got a little secret for you, and it's a secret I've, you know... Stumbled into, not from an Illuminati, from the Holy Ghost. Somebody say amen. <laughs> that the Lord never stops showing up. You ought to give your neighbor a high five and tell them the Lord be showing up. The Lord be showing up. <laughs> the, the challenge for some of us, though, is we are not aware of the Lord's arrival. And so when the Lord show up, we don't even appreciate that there's a blessing there's some wisdom 
There's some grace. There's some healing. There's some opportunities that are closer to us than they were yesterday. Why? Because the Lord just showed up. And Advent is necessary because it attempts to take time and wrestle it out of our hands and put it back into divine time. Give you an opportunity to step out of your time and get back into divine time and understand that God has not stopped showing up when you need God the most. We have just lost the sensitivities to be able to recognize when God shows up and then respond in kind, knowing that when God shows up, God then requires you to show up in a different kind of way. Woo, I hope you just heard what I said. When God shows up, God expects you to show up in a different kind of way. I'm going to say it one more time because, you know, I've been going a while. Y'all know if y'all heard me. When God shows up, he expects you to show up in a different kind of way. And the consciousness of what that means in a world of war, amidst injustice, in violent spaces and conditions, in families that are transitioning and children that are losing their mind, in neighborhoods that are being engulfed in violence and poverty. What that means is when God shows up, <laughs> he's still expecting you to show up in a different kind of way. Ooh, tell your neighbor, don't, don't be no goat today. You better be a sheep. <laughs> because when God shows up, I'm going to say it one more time. He's expecting you to show up in a different kind of way. And this is why we got to prepare ourselves. Because how many keep it real? When we don't think God is around, Amen. we act a little different. Yeah. You must <laughs> be honest about this. Yeah. It is virtually impossible for you to be conscious of God all the time. Because if you were really conscious of God Hallelujah. all the time, Hallelujah. you wouldn't act the way you do yes. some of the time. Not all the time. You know, some of us, you know, I'm pretty good people. You know, we don't do some of these things all the time. But can you imagine that God sometimes needs to give you a regular scheduled pop-up? Just to remind you, hey, hey you know, I just want you to know I'm here. You're like... Lord, I'm sorry. I kind of lost myself. I thought, you know, kind of got a little fool of myself. I was kind of feeling myself. I was a little preoccupied with the uh, vicissitudes of life, and I kind of forgot that God, you popped up. Mm -hmm. That's how we're regularly situated. I mean, I'm somebody who don't like to go to the dentist because... They got machines in there that make noises you don't hear anywhere else in your life. And if you brush your teeth and floss like you're supposed to, you realize that everything in your mouth is sensitive. And then you go into an office and you'll be sitting in the waiting room. Then all of a sudden, out of nowhere, ah, you're, ah, you sit there like, and I'm supposed to go back into that. But you realize that if you don't keep your regularly scheduled appointment, that's why you go out and you're done with the dentist, okay, we'll book you in six months. They don't ask you, when would you like to come back? Because they appreciate, no, I'm just going to book you. Because you, you ain't going to ask for what, you, gonna, what you, you need to get. I mean, that's how God is. God says, I will have a regularly scheduled pop-up in the course of your year because you can't schedule what you need from me at the kind of rhythm and rate that you need. You need me to show up 
right on time, every time. And I'll say it again, when God shows up, he expects you to show up in a different kind of way. Advent then is us preparing ourselves for the arrival of God. And in the text, it's so important to appreciate that verse number 31 says it like this, that when the son of man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, he will sit on the throne of his glory. I want you to appreciate that this language used by Jesus in Matthew chapter 25 and 31 is often used, misused, and misinterpreted by so many people to assume that they know and understand how the use of apocalyptic language, which is what it's called, the Son of Man is used in the biblical text, in the Jewish text, mostly by the prophets in ways and places, Ezekiel, Daniel, the Son of Man. It is this reference to a God-like, divine-like figure who will come to help prepare for the day of the Lord, the day of God's vengeance on the enemies of Israel, particularly in the biblical context. Now, there's so many people. I mean, it's a very fascinating thing, and this all came up since the Israel-Palestine conflict. Similarly, it kind of came up with folks during COVID, because everybody who, you know, became a biblical scholar during COVID, it confounded me. <laughs> Pastor Mike, this is the end of the world. I said, really? Yes, the, 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 the vaccine is the mark of the beast. I said, really? It's in the Bible. I said, really? I think we lost a few members behind that conversation. Because I asked them, is that a teaching that I taught you? No, Pastor Mike. I said, where'd you get that from? Oh, you know, I sky on YouTube. I said, YouTube. Fascinating. How many degrees have people earned from the University of YouTube? Don't it make some of us who actually paid some money to sit and learn about something, a little, feel a little cheated. Like, man, all I had to do was watch a few hours of an unnamed, unknown person on YouTube, and my understanding would have opened up like the Red Sea. No. No, no, no. You must appreciate that there is often Many a mystery in the biblical text that is preached by human beings as Jesus says doctrines when they are actually commandments of men. Great is the mystery of godliness, the scripture says, which to me just means that there are many things you may not understand, but the things you do understand you ought to hold fast to. And there are things that we can't understand. There are embodied ways of being in the world that are not mysterious. And so for many folks who try to use the apocalyptic language of scripture, language that is literally layered with symbolism and ideas from multiple religious and cultural contexts, and you are trying to figure out how does that apply to today? I say, you know, many a book has been written about the mysteries of sacred texts. But there are some simplicities across our religious traditions that are not so hard to grasp. And we've read a few of them today that I want to commission to you, but I want to invite you to not major in the mysteries and minor in the knowns. Because there are some things that God shows us about how we ought to show up in the world. 
And I want to argue that this text tells us we have to show up as sheep and not as goats. Why? So when the Son of Man shows up, this figure Jesus describes or uses this language to describe himself mostly to a Jewish audience in the book of Matthew. Why? Because Jesus understood that when I use this language, a particular image in the mind of the Jewish audience is literally being triggered and awakened. Why? Because Jesus shows up in a context where they themselves are living under the oppression of a violent state. And I want you to appreciate, child of God, much, much of the Bible is written to people who are living under the occupation and the violence of a state, of a nation, of a government. This idea that the Bible is written to the powerful is not necessarily the case unless the powerful are willing to take it seriously that I must use my power in ways that bring life and not death. And so for you and I, I have a question. When Jesus shows up, when the Son of Man comes in all of his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. The scripture is literally inviting us to think about when Jesus shows up with all of the power and the grace and the authority that embodies his arrival. How will we be found? That is why I ask people all the time. I stop asking people, are you a Christian? I ask people now, what kind of Christian are you? Because there are a lot of Christians out here who love to be warmongers, haters, imperialists, abusers of their partners, spouses, wives, husbands, children, co-workers, employees. Love to say, oh, I follow Jesus, but I want to know, is Jesus following you? <laughs> is Jesus, if, is what you leave behind a residue of the life, the work, the embodied practices of Jesus. Don't tell me that you are a Christian. I want to know what kind of Christian are you? Because how many know sometimes being a Christian ain't just good enough? You got to be a certain kind of a Christian in a world that is looking for the arrival of the God of all creation. And we, somebody pat yourself on the chest and say, I, we are God's ambassadors. And so how do you show up when God shows up? God is always inviting you, as he says in the text, to be mindful of how you treat your neighbor. Someone asked me, oh, Pastor Mike, why did you speak out on this particular situation? I said, because when I look at what's happening out there in Israel, Palestine, I see a lot of hungry people because food has been cut off. I see a lot of thirsty people because water has been cut off. I see a lot of unhoused people because their homes have been destroyed. I see a lot of suffering because the literal governmental responses to tragedies have now created a catastrophe. And guess what, beloved? We have that experience here. People will use our challenges, our foibles, our, 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 Pains and manipulate us into causing harm or allowing harm to be caused to others in our name. But I want you to know there is no excuse for causing harm. If you are a person with power in any relationship, the scripture challenges you to do no harm. I know some of us is like, oh, Pastor Mike, you tell them. You tell the president. You tell the commander. 
Guess what? I'm telling you too. How many of you can acknowledge that you're in relationships that have a power dynamic? You're in a relationship with some hierarchies where men can have more power than women, where rich can have more power than the poor, where the educated can have more power than the uneducated, where the unincarcerated can have more power than the incarcerated, where those who may not have certain kinds of mental challenges and illnesses caused by trauma can have more power than those who are struggling to, to live under the weight of their own trauma, anger, fear, and pain. We are being invited into this text to not just point at the systems, but to also look at ourselves and say, when Jesus shows up, how will I be found? Yes, I want war to end in the world. Yes, I want occupation to end. Yes, I want the slaughtering of the innocents to end. But I want also for you and I to treat one another with the kind of love and dignity and tenderness that creates the world that we say we want. How many know that peace starts at home? Charity starts at home. I want to call for peace in the world, but I also want to call for peace in my house. I want to call for justice in the world, but I also want to have justice in my city. I want to call for healing in the world, but guess what? I want you to be healed as well. And when God shows up, God then will require you to show up very differently. And this is why in this passage is so deep. Because when the son of man shows up. The image used by Jesus to set the stage for what happens next is so fascinating. Sheep and goats. Goats and sheep. I'm not an agricultural person. I don't know the difference between a sheep and a goat. But it seems to me, it seems to me that Sheeps and the goats seem to be living together. It seems to me that to the sheep and the goat, they may have some differences, but even they among themselves are not always distinguishable from one another. It seems to me that the ones who think they are sheeps may not know they are sheeps until they are told they are sheep, which means there's something very powerful about the shepherd being able to identify you as a sheep before you even know that you are a sheep. Why? Because the shepherd is looking at the behavior of a sheep. And the sheep is not even aware. Man, I'm over here on the right hand. Why can't I be on the left hand? Cheryl, are you a sheep? You just hang out over here. But what did I do to be a sheep? You did this, you did this, you did this. But I never did that. Yes, you did. Can you imagine if we lived our lives so aligned with God's arrival that just our natural actions towards our neighbor always resulted in sheepish behavior. Are y'all following what I'm saying this morning? I mean, it's one thing to wake up and say, I'm going to be a sheep today. It's another thing to just do sheepish things and not even know that's what you're doing. All of us who have children and your kids are a little bit like you, and you be looking at them. They just lying in your face. You know, just, te just telling all kind of lies. You looking at them. My father, I'm, I'm dealing with this now with my teenagers. My dad would say, son, I know you better than you know yourself. You done been, or I done been where you trying to go. I could telegraph your behavior. Why? Because I did it 30 years ago. 
How you kick your No, he don't, he don't know. He don't know. My, I'm not you. I'm my own person. I make my own decisions. You 14 year old talking about I make my own decisions. I, I, you know, it's like, no. It's like, how many of y'all watch Good Times or the, or the Cosby Show or the Jeffersons? Or, how many watch it so many times that you know the next scene before it happens? And you start laughing before it even, because you just, you already tickled. You got an anticipatory tickle coming. Oh, this is about to be funny. Watch this, watch this, watch this. Can you imagine what would it take for our nature as followers of Jesus to be so informed that God anticipates sheepish behavior from the follower of Jesus in a world too dominated by goats? That if someone is hungry, the goat response is, I hope you find some food. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, hope you, I hope you figure it out because, you know, you get yours because what? Goldish behavior. Somebody say amen, right? See how that's in you? You didn't even have to think about it. Some of you yelled it out. I'm going to get mine. But that's not sheepish behavior. Said if your neighbor is hungry, what does it say? Feed them. Somebody say, be like the sheep. If your neighbor is thirsty, give them something to drink. Somebody say, be like the sheep. If your neighbor is naked, give them some clothes. I say, be like the sheep. If your neighbor is sick or in prison, You got to go see about them. Amen. Can you imagine if we were so conscious of the ongoing arrival of Jesus that we did not want Jesus to pop up on us and we were not visiting those who are sick or in prison? Jesus pop up, hey, did you go see your, your nephew that's in jail? What? He did the crime. He got to do the time, Jesus. Can you imagine saying that to the Lord? How many would say that to the Lord? Jesus showed up. Have you wanted to see? What? Jesus. He did the time, the crime. He got to do the time. I've sat in rooms with preachers who say that foolishness to mayors, to sheriffs, to police officers. And I'm sitting there like, no wonder you want to be the goat. Because you're displaying goatish behavior. God shows up so you and I, we can show up in a world characterized by tragedy very differently. I don't know what's happening with God's activity in world events. I'll be honest about that. I've met people virtually over the last several weeks who have said things to me like, how can you still believe in God? What kind of God allows children to be killed and do nothing? What kind of God allows wicked men to make decisions for so many and stay in power? What kind of God allows wars and catastrophes to metastasize and God does not intervene. And I have to be honest, there are some days where I sit in my solitude and ask God, where are you? I've asked God that at the death of one of my young people. It didn't take 10,000 people to be killed for me to ask God that question. How much can be honest and say, it don't take 10,000 tragedies for me to ask God, where are you? I got one tragedy a week, a month, a year. I'd be like, God, what is going on? 
But could it be, beloved, that there are times when when we ask God these questions, God is reminding us that my arrival is actually embodied in you. For when I was sick, I tried to show up in you. But where were you? When I was in prison, I tried to show up in you. But where were you? When wars were raging and peace needed to be called for, I tried to show up in you. When your nation was trying to spend 14 billion more dollars to bring more weapons and drop them on poor people in other parts of the world, I tried to show up in you. Where were you, church? Where were you, church? Were you being a sheep or a goat? Because I believe there's enough followers of Jesus so-called in the earth that if God is really with us, God is literally here right now waiting for us to be sheep that feed, that heal, that intervene. And some of us are. Not to negate, you know, I, 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 I'm, I'm about to close because, I, you know, I, when I've gone a long time, I talk a long time. But I got most Sundays to make it up. Somebody say amen. amen. But I am somebody who wants to believe that it's hard to show up as something that you're not. It's hard to show up as a person of peace if you have not embodied peace. It's hard to show up as a person of love when you have not embodied love. It's hard to show up as somebody who loves everybody when you hate a lot of folk. It's hard to show up as a citizen of the world when you are a patriot of your own nation. God so loved the world. God didn't love the United States. God didn't love Israel. God didn't love Palestine. God didn't love China. God didn't love, love, love the continent. God didn't lo- God loved the whole thing. And guess what? God's people are literally in the whole world. One of the greatest lies I had to unlearn when I went to Israel, Palestine, is that there's just as many Christians living in the Holy Land as Muslims, as Jews, as agnostic, that Chris, do you not know that Bethlehem, the place where Jesus was born, is under occupation? Which just means that the government of Israel literally has limited the movement of other Christians and Muslims and Arabs and, 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 and literally where Jesus was born, folk can't even move around there freely. Christians. I didn't know that until I went there. Because, you know, when I went, my first time, you know, well, going to the Holy Land. Oh, I'm going to go to the tomb of Jesus. I'm a, I'm a, and I realized, man, you know, the oldest church, the fourth oldest church in the world is right here. Things I had to unlearn in order for me to embrace the whole world. And so, beloved, today, my question to us, are we going to be like sheep? and not like goats. Are we going to appreciate that when God shows up, he expects you to show up very differently than how we've been showing up? Someone asked me, what side are you on? I said, I'm on the side of peace every time. Oh, but Pastor Mike, what if there are people that don't want peace? That sounds like a problem for them. (laughs) But as the scripture says, follow peace with everyone. 
and holiness without which no one shall see the Lord. There is a need in 2023 for you and I to show up in every relationship we're in as people who exhibit sheepish behavior. And again, just to define what I mean by sheepish behavior. When I was hungry, you gave me food. Think of all the ways in which the relationships you're in, God is compelling you to show up differently. When I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. When I was a stranger, you welcomed me. When I was naked, you gave me clothing. When I was sick, you took care of me. Amen. When I was in prison, you visited me. So I said, be like the sheep. God is asking you, when I arrive, when I pop up, when I make this regularly scheduled appointment in your life, will you be a sheep or will you be a goat? Oh, beloved, come on, let's be like the sheep. Come on, stand up with us and let's prepare to pray. Here I am, here I stand, Lord, my life is in your hands, Lord, I long to see your desires, your desire fulfilled. In. I give myself away, give myself away. Hey, I give myself so you can use me. Hey, God. Sending nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. Grab the hand of someone next to you. Come on, everybody, grab somebody's hand across the aisle. Come on, grab somebody's hand and let's take a few moments and let's just invite the Lord to use us in ways that we know we must be found when Jesus arrives. God, you will show up not just once, but over and over and over again. And when you arrive, God, I want to be found as a sheep in the world and not as a goat. I want to be found showing kindness to my neighbor, meeting the needs of my family. I want to be an agent of peace in the world and not of war. I want to be on the side of justice. I want to start with the least of these. And I want to do it, God, so you can get the glory out of my life so you can be found in the earth in an abundant manner through the people who follow you. And so pray for your neighbor right now. Squeeze their hand gently. God, I pray for the needs that are in their lives. I pray for the heartaches, oh God. I, I practice right now, God, that if my neighbor is sick, if my neighbor is imprisoned, Lord God, mentally, physically, emotionally, psychologically, God, I pray, God, that the prayers I pray, the proximity I have to them will open up the jail doors and they can be free today free from depression, free from suicide, free from, from pain and anger and fear, free God so they can be who you need them to be in the world and not reacting God to the pains 
and the shames of their life. Lord, I pray right now for the family of who I'm touching. Squeeze their hand gently, God. I pray for healing in their family. I pray for strength in their family. I pray for reconciliation in their family. I pray, God, that the spirit of the living God will swoop into their family today. God, I pray for those who are touching God, who have family members who are incarcerated, who have relatives and friends who are caught in the tragedies of Israel, Palestine, Congo, Sudan. I pray, God, for the immigrants and the undocumented among us. I pray, God, that you will remind them that you have loved the world and they are not forgotten. And so, God, I squeeze, Lord God, peace and justice and hope into their hands. I pray, God, that they will feel a new energy that comes from your spirit that makes them alive. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Now lift those hands right where you're standing. It's me, oh Lord, and I stand in the need of prayer. I need you. Somebody say, I need you, Lord. It's not my mother. It's not my father. It's not my sister. It's not my brother. But I need you today. I need you to give me, God, a special dose of the Holy Ghost. I need you, God, to open my eyes so I can see. I need you, God, to mend my broken heart. I need you to set my mind free. I need you to stabilize my mind. I come against, oh God, every fool of sickness and illness that will cripple the mind. I pray, God, that you will give me what I need to be a faithful follower of you in this season and in this time. You may be here today and you have not yet accepted the Lord and you want to be saved today. Meet me here at the altar. You may be here today and you say, I just need prayer. I'm trying to be a sheep and I'm surrounded by goats, but I know that God is calling me in this moment in my life to be a sheep, to be a representative of God in the world. In violence, I need to be a peacemaker. In painful space, I need to be a healer. Come and let's pray together. Come and let's seek the face of God together. We'll pray with you. We'll lay our hands. You may be sick in your body and you need to be healed. Come on and let's believe that God is a healer. God is able to do anything but fail. God, we trust you. God, we believe you. God, we know that you are able to do what we ask. Withholding nothing, say.